Hello, everybody. Welcome to our event today on how should policymakers respond to the growing need for emergency food support services. So I'm KK. I'm a research fellow based in uh, Queen's University. I'm one half of the International Public Policy Observatory um, and I division led by Professor Marsh McCarthy. Um, so I guess the basis of this event was um, to highlight one of the possibly most visible and distressing consequences of austerity and looking at that through the lens of the recurring cycle of poverty and that link between high fuel and energy tariffs, the increasing rate of child poverty and higher than ever, ever levels of people needing the services of emergency food assistance. Underpinning today's event is the question of the sustainability of current measures for food poverty policy and its future recommendations. So we have a blog written um, by Dominic Waters uh, on the link between free school meals and the future of poverty policy. Uh, we'll drop that into the chat a bit later on. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so our speakers today will reflect not only on the changes in consumer behavior um, amidst the current cost of living crisis, uh, the current state and logistics of food assistance, but also look towards what that future of poverty policy looks like, how that's delivered, and the necessity for linked partnerships and multi-service referrals. So I'll start with our first speaker, and I'll hand over to you, Philippa McKeown, um, who is the Head of Food Policy and Emerging Markets at Consumer Council Northern Ireland. Yeah, so um, good morning. I'm Philippa McKeown-Brown, and I head up our food policy team for the Consumer Council for Northern Ireland. Before I begin, just to say a big thank you to KK for organizing today's event and asking us to speak at it. Um, yeah, just for anyone not wholly familiar with who the Consumer Council are, with the statutory body for Northern Ireland representing consumer concerns and interest in energy, transport, water and sewage, postal services, and then my area, which is food. And for food, we focus specifically on affordability and accessibility. So if we think about those elements, they really are the essentials for daily life. And the research that we do to protect and represent consumers gives us a good understanding of how consumers are coping, or in many cases, not coping with the ongoing cost of living crisis. Before um, going into our specific food research, just to give you an overview of the consumer context for Northern Ireland, we often find ourselves in a position of having to explain to policymakers how Northern Ireland is different than the rest of the UK, whilst at the same time accepting that there are similarities with other regions. Um, a good example of this is the fact that the population here in Northern Ireland is much more rural than that of the rest of the UK, and that can sometimes cause issues for access to services. We have higher levels of economic activity in the UK, and our lowest income households are more reliant on social securities. Going across to income and expenditure, it's important to point out that the average household income is lower than that of the UK and our average weekly discretionary income is lower. So this is in accordance with the ASDA income tracker, which finds for the average um, weekly discretionary income, which is money left after all the essentials have been paid for. Um, is £103 per week. But in a moment, I'll focus in on what that looks like specifically for lowest earning, income, uh, lowest earning households. The other thing to understand is that the markets are different here in Northern Ireland. So energy, the energy market's a prime example. 68% um, of households here in Northern Ireland is reliant on home heating oil, which is an unregulated fuel. And we estimate that 51% of households in Northern Ireland is currently living in fuel poverty. Now, unfortunately, we don't have figures for what that looks like in terms of food poverty, but it wouldn't be a far stretch of the imagination that it's, it's in and around that. And certainly food bank usage would be a, a prime indicator of that. In my next slide, I've just pulled out some of the key findings from our Northern Ireland household expenditure tracker, which we publish quarterly. And what this does is to track income and spend for all household types, and it, it splits into four quartiles. And quartile one are the lowest earning households. So this is our latest report, and it covers the period of July until September um, last year. And what it found was 
that discretionary income figure, which the average, if you remember, for ASDA was £103, for lowest earning households, it's just £31. And that's per week, per household, not per individual. And even if you look at the next income bracket up from that, um, it would mean that the, on average households would have just £90 left at the end of the week. Now, that £31 is actually an increase on the last quarter. It's up by 17.8%, but it's actually a drop of almost half from this time last year. And that's the thing. Households here in Northern Ireland has, ex are experiencing a long extended period of higher food prices, higher energy prices, and they're basically tapped out. They've tapped out all sources of support. They've tapped out um, credit, borrowing, family and friends. And that's leading to some dire situations where you have more people using credit cards to pay for basics. Things like buy now, pay later. And we're seeing from other parts of our research more usage of illegal money lenders. Next, if we look at where um, lowest incomes are spending their money, you'll see from that donut diagram on the right hand side, over half, so 53% of the money is, is spent on the bare essentials. And of that, um, more is spent covering food and non-alcoholic drink costs than the combined costs of housing, water, electricity, energy, and other fuels. So that's really quite telling, I think. And just as an aside, really, just um, to talk about that picture of the haves and have nots, when we talk about um, discretionary income, Highest earning households in Northern Ireland have 21 times more disposable income than the lowest earning households. So that can sometimes skew policymakers' ideas of just how difficult it can be at the sharp end for consumers. So what does this mean? What are we seeing as a result of this? In the last two years, we've carried out a raft of research, qualitative and quantitative, to understand how higher food costs are impacting consumers here in Northern Ireland. And the key themes coming through are, well, first and foremost, um, affordability. That really overshadows every single other element. So the cost of food. Um, but even though cost is a huge driver for consumer buying decisions, what comes through time again is that consumers are very aggrieved and concerned about quality, the fact that they're having to sacrifice on the quality of food because of higher food prices. The next column um, is from our cost of basics research, which we're publishing next week. So I'm just going to give you some of the high level findings from that. And that shows us that 80 percent of consumers are concerned about the cost of food and non-alcoholic drinks. And this is having an impact both on mental health and also physical health. So you can see there over a quarter are eating less nutritious food um, due to high prices. And another impact is that two thirds of consumers are cutting back on eating out and socializing. And they're reporting this having an effect on their mental health as well. People are feeling socially isolated. Um, what I should say about the cost of basics research is that it was a household survey of 100, uh, sorry, 1,033 consumers um, representative of the, of the entire Northern Ireland population. So these figures really speak volumes as to the impact of higher food prices. The next column is our food focus group um, research that we did last year. And we took a new approach because we're very used to asking consumers, what are they doing in response to higher food prices? But we hadn't really asked how consumers were feeling. So we presented them with a food emotions poll, which had both positive and negative emotions that they could choose from. But the responses most highly ranked were that consumers are feeling anxious, frustrated, stressed, and angry. Also a lot of talk about feeling exploited and a lot of talk about feeling caught off guard by just how quickly food prices went up at a time when energy prices were already so high. And then the last column there is the, the common coping strategies that we're seeing from consumers. So switching and shopping around, things like downshifting brands and changing where they're doing their shopping, buying less, which I've already talked about, skipping meals, um, and then an increased use of food banks. So just to share some of the consumer voices from our research, this is from our food focus groups and it talks about um, specifically about consumers food bank experiences. And what you'll see there is two of the comments and I mean there were, there were plenty more were from people that were from relationships that have broken down and we know from the 
breakdown of client use at Trussell Trust, that that's a common thing coming through there. And then on the next slide, I've just brought you some of the quotes from our cost to basics research. So there you can see people talking about the mental impact, the physical health impact. Um, that comment there, I just think that we are malnourished now. And I think that's what we are looking at. We're looking at not just food poverty, but increasingly um, nutrition poverty. And as much as there's an inevitability to that, it makes it no less shocking when you see it coming through in consumers, com in consumers comments. So what do we need to do about it? How should policymakers respond since that's what we're looking at today? Well, I think it's a mixture really of recognition and prioritization. So I've broken them down like this. The first one is we have to recognize that everyone has a right to affordable, adequate, nutritious food. It's there clearly in black and white. Um, it's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, 1966. It's clearly there in the Convention of Rights of the Child, 1989, which specifically mentions food and housing. And more recently, it's in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So goal two, to end hunger by 2030. And that's looking, that's for all people, but specifically um, poor and vulnerable people, including infants. Um, and the goal is to have safe, nutritious food of an adequate quality all year round. And that's the key here as well. It's about adequate and nutritious. It's not cheap food. It's not food that's been donated. It's not food that's been salvaged from the wider food supply chain. It's food that that post person has chosen for themselves and for their family that will give them health and enjoyment. And these are basic fundamental rights that I know I take for granted and that every single person should be able to do the same. So how do we do that? Well, there needs to be that recognition that it should be government led rather than what we're seeing currently, which is a reliance on third sector and um, charitable institutions. And the thing is, there are mechanisms for this. In Northern Ireland, we have a range of, um, a raft of legislation and strategies that have been developed and are in um, various stages of development that can address this. And how those interplay then with the forthcoming anti-poverty strategy will be critical. Um, in doing all of this, I'll stress again, affordability is absolutely key. It's obviously welcome that food inflation has fallen in the last couple of months from the peak that we had um, this time last year. But nevertheless, food prices are still increasing, albeit more slowly. And um, all indicators are that food prices will continue to rise. We have civil unrest, we have climate shocks, we have labor shortages, higher energy costs for producers. All of these things um, will lead to higher food prices. So income needs to match that. So there has to be that prioritization of um, income and bene benefit realization. Um, and a huge part of that, and I'll not say too much because I know that my fellow speakers will be, be talking about it as well, is this cash first response. It's it's allowing people that dignified manner of accessing food that's talked about in all of the widely um, agreed definitions of food poverty and how to address it. And on that note, in our recent cost of basics research, we asked consumers what they would do with 20 pounds extra in their pocket after essentials are paid. And that 20 pounds is equivalent to the uplift that we had seen with universal credit. And it's very telling that 39% said um, that they would spend it on food. And 16% said that they would it would enable them to, to buy treats and to boost the morale of their family. And 13% said that they would spend it on stocking up on things like tinned goods, um, frozen goods, because it goes, speaks back to that feeling caught off guard by how quickly prices rose. There has been that real shock to consumers. Um, and so they're obviously wanting to put measures in place to stop that happening again. The next um, is if we want to put money in people's pockets, we need to have a realistic figure for what that would be. And I think it's useful to look at the exercise that was done by the Vincentian Partnership for Social Justice on behalf of our colleagues at Food Standards Agency, NI, 
safe food and also ourselves. And this began in 2016 and asked consumers to devise a healthy food basket that was adequate and acceptable. Um, a meal plan was devised. And in the latest report, which was published in 2022, it found that for a family of four, so two adults and two children, it would equate to 45% of their take home income to afford a healthy balanced um, basket of food to last them a week. And for that was for a family reliant on benefits. For a family um, where one adult was working and earning the national living wage, that would be 31%. So almost a third of take home income would be needed. So you can see how far short benefits that social securities are in meeting that need just for food alone before you take into any other um, household bills. But lastly, we do need to recognize that there will always be a need for emergency food support. Um, there will always be people that, whether temporarily or permanently, need that extra support from those working in food banks and the advice sector to get them out of that cycle of poverty. But if you address the root causes of um, food poverty or all poverty at um, upstream, then you're going to lessen the amount of emergency support needed. So that has to be a key priority. And um, with that, that brings me to the end of my presentation and look forward to hearing the other speakers and taking any questions at the end. So thank you. Thank you very much, Felda. Um, really important point about the right to food and dignity that often isn't hand to hand when it comes to using food banks and the root causes. Um, okay, so I'll hand over to our second speaker, uh, who's Abby Preston, a project officer at the Independent Food Aid Network. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Abby as uh, KK said, and I work for the Independent Food Aid Network, and I work as a project officer on the Cash First Referral Leaflet project that I'll touch on briefly a little bit later. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a cash first approach to food insecurity, which Philip had touched on earlier, but I'm going to go into in a bit more detail now. So for anyone who doesn't know, the Independent Food Aid Network is a network of over 550 independent food banks. And we have a vision of a country without the need for charitable food aid, where adequate and nutritious food is affordable to all. The consistent message from our members in terms of the situation on the ground currently is that food bank teams are struggling to cope with the surge in demand that has been in progress since spring 2022. And this message is reflected in our data. Um, as you can see, these are some uh, statistics from our latest uh, IFAN member survey. And uh, as you can see, 98% of those surveyed reported supporting people who had not asked for help before and nearly half said that if demand increases, they may not be able to support everyone who asks for support. And this is something that we're seeing really consistently. Um, alongside this, the mental health and physical exhaustion of food bank volunteers is uh, decreasing rapidly and has been since spring 2022. And many of our food bank teams reporting are uh, reporting that they're struggling to cope. It's also uh, vital to point out alongside this that most people who report food insecurity do not actually access a food bank. So the latest uh, DWP family resources survey showed that well, 5% of UK households reported severe insecurity in the 30 days that they were surveyed, 86% of this number were found not to be using a food bank. And this will, I'm sure, be something supported in the Food Standards Agency data, which I think was released this morning. While we're here to talk about um, emergency food services and emergency food aid, what's really vital about our messaging is that we're calling for the end for the need for all charitable food aid not just food banks, because uh, the lack of attendance at uh, uh, or the lack of people seeking help is applicable to wider charitable food aid. So food pantries, social supermarkets, breakfast clubs, holiday hunger programs and things like that, not just the emergency food aid. 
So it's vital to point out that while seeking to end the need for food banks, we don't want to create a glut of people visiting charitable food aid and creating the same situation there uh, that was previously in it with food banks. And in terms of how policymakers should respond, as this is the uh, obviously theme of this webinar, we think that the best way is through a cash first approach. And I'll go through that in a bit more detail in a second. But firstly, we've got some evidence as to why cash payments are preferable in a crisis. And for this slide, we've got some evidence from overseas. So I just want to draw your attention to one of the quotes from the uh, Department for International Development, who say that cash transfers are an effective way of directly helping some of the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world, and they're good value for money. So uh, the viewer I fan is, is if that can be done overseas, we don't see any reason why this can't be done here. We also have evidence that cash first works in a UK context as well. Um, so according to the uh, uh, DWP Family Resources Survey, the £20 uplift resulted in a 16% reduction in severe and moderate food insecurity, which is concurring with what Philippa was talking about earlier. We have also seen that with the Scottish Child Payment in Scotland, and we've had anecdotal evidence from our food banks talking about the drop in attendance uh, due to the recent cost of living payments. So this is something that clearly works. When we talk about cash first, we're not just talking about uh, giving people sort of small amounts of one-off money. We're talking about the social security system and wages being sufficient so that everyone can afford the food they need and no one needs to visit a food bank. And in this infographic here, we've got a what we call a hierarchy of cash first. So starting from the top down, the adequate social and security and wages is the ideal for us in terms of cash first. And alongside this, we would be looking for cash payments to be available via a local authority when a genuine crisis emerges, such as a relationship breakdown or family bereavement or something like that. Um, and sort of further down the hierarchy, uh, we have cash or vouchers available from an advice agent, which is more dignified, but ideally we'd be looking at that provision from um, the state or the local authority. And then further down, uh, we've got vouchers or cash via a charitable food aid provider, and we've got food parcels available for a charity food aid provider. And while the vouchers and cash may be slightly more dignified from the food parcels, it's still a stopgap measure and it still isn't addressing the root causes of why someone is visiting charitable food aid in the first place. And for the top three, it's really important to say that advice is absolutely fundamental to a cash first approach and adequate funding for advice agencies is something that's going to be really key. Uh, I just want to sort of touch briefly on Scotland as there's some sort of really pioneering stuff going on in Scotland at the minute. And we, Philippa touched on a right to food earlier, which is uh, super helpful because it's not something I, I need to explain now. But uh, what's really sort of key about Scotland is that they're the first country to propose enacting a right to food in law. And this is something that a lot of countries who are having this issue of emergency food aid could take note from because this is something that's been proliferating in rich countries sort of by decade all over the world. And what each national government needs is a national plan to ending the need for food banks because this is something ultimately that can only be resolved by the state. And this is the plan that I was uh, talking about earlier. So um, it's, as I said, it's the only country to outline a rights-based commitment to tackling food insecurity and also a cash-first one. 
and particularly welcome in this plan is the commitment to uh, what we call cash first partnerships. So the funding from the Scottish government for local authorities, uh, the community sector and the advice services to carry out that cash first support for people. So putting in place some kind of emergency fund or, for example, as well, funding us to carry out the worrying about money leaflet project so that uh, people can get that advice about where they can go to maximise their income at the earliest opportunity. Um, and that leads me on to the cash first referral leaflet project. And as I said, advice is absolutely fundamental to a cash first approach. And these leaflets are step-by-step -step guides to direct people to local advice services where they can find advice to maximize their income and access any existing financial entitlements they might have. And we have these leaflets available in 123 local authority areas across the UK. And hopefully soon, as you can see, this is in the draft stages at the minute, but we're hoping to have our first one in Northern Ireland very soon. So that's that's that would be great if we can. Um, and another sort of thing that's come around the thinking of the plan for the end for the need for food banks is we're starting to see changes in practice and what this is sort of evident in this Citizens Advice Scotland food insecurity pilot for when someone who was visiting them who ordinarily would be referred to emergency food aid, they were offered a choice as to whether they wanted to receive vouchers or shopping cards or they wanted to receive a food bank referral. And the aim for this was to enable some more dignity and choice for the people that were visiting and also to address some of the long-term reasons why someone might need citizens advice as alongside this choice there was a lot of holistic wraparound support available as well so we are starting to see changes in practice from advice services at the minute and ones that do work and this sort of partnership working was kind of came together in the Cash First Community Conference that IFAN held alongside the Trussell Trust in March, where what we discussed the most was how everyone can embed Cash First on a local level. And as you can see, a range of teams attended that conference from the government, local authorities, charities, the advice service and food banks as well. Um, so it was really great to see everyone's ideas about how cash first can be embedded on a local level. And one of the exercises we did was uh, this card as to for people to identify what was going on in their area and to for people to understand that everyone has a role to play in building a society where nobody needs to turn to charitable food aid. And I've talked a little bit about Scotland, but it's also really important to note that cash first is breaking through in England and other areas of the UK as well. So we've engaged a lot with many local authority areas through our leaflet advocacy work. And we've also collaborated with um, councils like Cornwall to improve their sort of uh, to, to improve access and availability to their emergency support grant so that that was work that was really valuable and it's also important to note that uh the recent all party parliamentary group on ending the need for food banks said that cash was much more preferable to emergency food aid in addressing the root causes of why someone was in that situation so we're slowly starting to see cash first kind of come to the fore as a uh i guess as a solution to poverty and uh charitable food aid increasingly is seen as a temporary unsustainable solution to why uh to, to why someone is in poverty which again the title of the 
uh, morning is how policymakers can respond to the growing need for emergency food services. So we've put together a list of our main asks due to the uh, sort of oncoming general election. And what we really want is social security payments in line with the cost of living. So a living income, at least the essentials guarantee, if not more. Um, I think that some of you will have seen Gordon Brown's recent article about uh, charities, companies and the government's kind of collaborating together to um, address charity uh, to, to address people in poverty and while obviously he is on the right lines what we really don't want as I said is charitable food aid becoming further institutionalized in the landscape as a response to poverty what we're also asking for is a removal of some of the punitive measures around the social security system as you can see there such as um, benefit cap two child limit etc we're also looking for local crisis support through uh, through permanent local crisis support through the household support fund in England. I know that Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have something centrally administered already. We're also looking for fair wages and employment practices and also increasing funding to advice agencies. And finally, something that's really, really important is we don't want food waste and food poverty to be conflated together as uh, by trying to address both with the same solution, you'll actually end up addressing neither. And as Philippa so succinctly put it, we want people to be able to choose the food they want with dignity and uh, to be able to participate in the mainstream food system with everyone else. Uh, the idea of people uh, eating food waste just it doesn't really sit right with anyone at IFAN so that's what we're asking for and uh, that brings me to the end of the presentation there's just some links there for some interesting things we've got on our website and some of our infographics as well so uh, happy to answer any questions at the end with everyone else so thanks very much for inviting me um, thanks Abby for um talking more about the rights-based approach and increasing people's uh, social agency by boosting not only their tangible resources like payments, but also, you know, knowing where to go to get that help and where to go to get that advice, as you rightly bring up. Um, so we'll go to our third um, speakers, which who are from Ulster University. So that's Professor Mark Shev Shevlin and Dr. Orla McBride, um, who will speak a little bit about uh, their study data, if you'd like to introduce. Well, I've got the I've got the the, the unenviable task of, of of presenting after after Philippa and and Abby, uh, both fantastic uh, talks. So I'll, I'll try and keep the momentum going. Uh, my name is Mark Shevlin. I'm from the School of Psychology at Ulster University, and I will be I'll be presenting some some work along that I've been doing along with. Uh, a colleague, uh, Dr. Orla McBride, and I, I suppose it, it kind of represents some some work from a broader consortium of of colleagues in the UK and and from from wider field. Uh, before we get going, just uh, yeah yeah again uh, a big thank you to the International Public Policy Observatory for giving us the opportunity to 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 speak this morning, also Kaka and or KK and and Deborah for their fantastic organisational work. Thank you. Okay, so I suppose the 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 title is how should policymakers respond to growing need for emergency food services and yeah I suppose I, I I'm a psychologist so I suppose I was how do I answer this I suppose I I think that that what policymakers should do is is maybe first and foremost get a good understanding of the of the problem so if we take a kind of a, a, a psychological perspective we. What, what would we do? I suppose we, we've got this. We've got this issue about emergency uh, food use. I suppose the first thing we would try to do is try to understand the prevalence, the geographical variation in the in in, in this type of in this type of, of behaviour. I suppose we'd kind of accept that there's likely to be kind of variability in 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 the use of emergency food services. So I suppose it's important to try and profile the the the, the different users, and of course 
uh, the, this the, this behavior doesn't doesn't occur in a in a social and economic vacuum. Uh, I suppose it would be important to try and understand the, the broader social and economic context of emergency food services, uh, and not just kind of the the, the predictors or or, or 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 those social and economic factors that may increase the likelihood of emergency food service use, but also what are the consequences? And uh, Philip has spoke a bit about this that there there there's there's evidence uh, there is evidence of the association between poor mental health and and food bank use. So I I, I suppose we kind of see this this problem in a in, in a kind of context where there are kind of precursors and consequences to emergency food use. So I suppose this question of what policymakers should do, um, I suppose we would we would make the suggestion that first of all you need to invest in the collection analysis of longitudinal household survey data to support the development of an evidence based policy to address food poverty in the in the UK. So I suppose what we're saying is the answer will lie in good quality data, and and I suppose not unexpected. I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that we that we have such data. Uh, the School of Psychology was, was part of a, a large consortium of of researchers who uh, who got together to try and monitor the kind of social and psychological and well-being consequences of the of the COVID pandemic. Uh, this the, this large population-based survey it, it started in March 2022. It was funded by the ESRC. It's a large nationally representative sample of the UK population, uh, represented in terms of income, gender, age, and, and a few other stratifying variables. And uh, the first wave uh, kicked off just uh, on the day of lockdown in 2020 and we are now in the ninth wave of data collection so we have been we, we've continued to follow uh, a substantial amount of our original participants across nine waves of of data and we've got a we, we've got a we've got a huge amount of information we we, we, we asked about individual level psychological characteristics about political attitudes and behaviors also a very very rich source of information on household and individual level economic factors such as Changes in household income, uh, the, the the actual income, the number of hours worked, changes in 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 economic activity, use of benefits, being in receipt of benefits, and so on. Uh, a few of the, the the later waves, we we focused on food insecurity and cost of living experiences, and we also, uh, being psychologists, we we used uh, the kind of gold standard self report diagnostic measures of common mental health problems. So maybe I can just give you a very brief kind of, kind of visual depiction of, of, of when we collected the, 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 the data. So here is a here is a kind of timeline uh, of, of the of the surveys that, that we conducted. We'll see that they're they're identified by the by, by the red lines. And what we've done here is we've plotted these against the the the, the kind of the, the, the major cost of living indices. So what we'll see is that early on, the first four or five waves of of data collection, uh, this occurred during during the during the the, the pandemic. Uh, it was this kind of it was it was kind of a time of 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 low inflation, but there was there, there was an enormous amount of of other kind of economically relevant events going on. There's furlough. There was there was a, a huge amount of economic kind of instability and, and uncertainty about employment and so on. As we emerged from that, what we see is that there has been a dramatic increase in these uh in these kind of inflation rates. And we have managed to 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 kind of capture information on all our participants through this uh the, this time of 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 economic uncertainty and 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 massive increase in the in the uh consumer price index. Um, I think the government wanted to think it's supposed to be about two percent. Well, we see there's been an enormous increase. What did we ask our participants during all these the, these waves? Well, we 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 asked a lot of stuff about about income, savings, debt, 
benefits. Uh, I suppose most interestingly for today in the in the last wave, we we had very detailed sections on financial security and food insecurity, and the the core cost of 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 living. Uh, I, mean, I suppose at this point, all all I can do is 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 give you a very very quick flavor or overview of some of the information that we've collected and and some of our initial results. Uh, the you, you know we 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 could we we could talk the entire day about the about the the, the amount of information that we have here, not just cross sectionally at 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 the most recent wave, but 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 also all the preceding waves. So just a flavor, uh, approximately four or five adults in the survey, just under 80%, reported that their household living costs had increased in the 12 months. Uh, we then, we, we asked these people, we, we asked them about, about kind of changes in their in their behavior. What we saw, what there was a vast amount, a huge amount of the, of the, of the, of the sample we're reporting using less energy, spending less on non-essential goods and services, shopping around more and, and, and so on. 13% uh, were using more credit than, than, than usual and so on. So, so, so these reflect kind of fundamental changes in, in people's kind of uh, people's behavior. Uh, more kind of relevant, more directly relevant to the to to the conversations this morning. Uh, we had asked about uh, food insecurity experiences. We used a standardized food insecurity experiences uh, questionnaire, and what we found was that there were high proportions of the population had uh, had kind of changed their behavior at only a few kinds of food because of lack of money were unable to eat healthy and nutritious food this is over a quarter of our of, of our of our nationally representative sample said they were eating less healthy food this echoes some of the issues that that, that philip and, and abby were, were were discussing earlier on uh people actually had less and there was a significant proportion about 11 percent here of people who went without eating food for for a whole day uh, of course these I, I suppose what's important to, to remember is that these headline figures kind of mask kind of very significant important differences in, in in these experiences so for example the the question went without eating for a whole day because of lack of money or other resources uh, the, the the kind of average for the entire sample was about uh, eleven point six percent. What we see if we stratify this by by income levels, those people in the lower in group, uh, lower income bands are reporting much much higher rates than that. Almost a quarter of those people in the lowest income band were reporting uh, uh, not eating for a whole day because of of of. Uh, lack of, of money and other resources. So what we see is that there's there's kind of predictable but enormous variability across these these indices. I'll just finish up now. I seem to run a little bit uh, a little bit behind. Uh, what about food bank use? What we found was that 8.2% of our uh, participants responded having used these. Uh, we can break that down over over time and kind of frequency of of, of use. So this is uh, this 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 looks to be a, a pretty high number in terms of the previous estimates of population level uh, food bank use in, in the UK. Some kind of some initial uh, analysis showed us that associated with things like uh, like no post secondary education, younger age living alone. What we saw was an enormous and very uh, and, and 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 very marked gradient in terms of how income predicts the likelihood of uh, food bank use. Those people in the lowest income band are 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 fifteen over fifteen times more likely compared to those in the highest income band. To reporting having used a, a, a food bank. Uh, I don't think it'll come as a surprise that 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 uh, having to use a food bank is associated with significantly higher likelihood of experiencing clinically relevant depression and anxiety. Uh, the, the the increased likelihood is about it's about, about six or eight times more likely for anxiety and depression respectively. Okay, so so kind of where to next? Uh, in summary, we have data from the most comprehensive population-based longitudinal household survey to help, import, to help 
answer important policy related questions. And um, I mean, we're we're psychologists. We're 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 not we're we're not into kind of kind of social policy. So I I, I suppose we're we're interested in collaboration. Uh, at at the minute we're we're, we're data rich and, and time poor. Uh, if anybody would 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 be interested in collaborating and answering or, or or posing some important questions that we could help answer, we'd be very interested in that. Uh, we also think it's it's incredibly important to to continue to monitor food insecurity, cost of living difficulties, and and so on to to develop a, an evidence base. So you know we think it would be incredibly important and valuable if we could continue uh, with this uh, with, with with this survey and 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 move it into into wave ten. Uh, if you're interested in the work we 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 have done and the kind of consortium, there's there's links here. Uh, thank you very much. I've been uh, uh, yep, Mark Shevlin speaking on behalf of uh, myself and Orlan Brad. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark. It's great to hear about your um, genome behavioural data regarding um, increased household costs because often I think policymakers' view can of this can be hidden. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about those issues in the Q&A. So I'll go to our fourth speaker then, um, that's uh, Dr. Andrew Williams, who's Senior Lecturer in Human Geography at Cardiff University and a Food Cooperative Leader, so if you'd like to. Right there. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I want to do something slightly different uh, today. And like usually I would talk about the problems within food banks. Uh, so since uh, 2014, uh, I've worked in different food banks, uh, Help One One uh, during COVID for a year and a half, um, helped set up a food co-op in February 2021, uh, which operates slightly differently. Uh, and it, it came out as a response to some of the, the limitations of the food bank model. Uh, and what I wanted to share was just a mixture of that kind of practitioner and academic insight, because it's grounded in very personal experiences. Um, and some of those experiences have been very difficult. But thinking about the future and what needs to be done, like whatever government comes into power, we're facing a deepening crisis. Austerity is baked into any future. And without a radical change in imagination, uh, the Labour government will simply be old wine in new bottles. Austerity has failed to reduce the UK's debt to GBT ratio, but it's also caused substantial damage to people and places. It's disproportionately hit the poorest places hardest, as well as women and racially minoritized people. And there are many others on this call with experiences of that, and many people on this call who work for local authorities, whose job it is to balance the unbalanceable, unbalance being asked to do impossible jobs. But there is a local authority funding gap estimated over the last, next two years of £4 billion pounds. And this comes on top of the substantial reduction in local authority spending power, as well as uh, an escalating demand and need for those services, particularly in areas of homelessness and poverty. And on top of that, you've got the cost of living crisis, inflationary pressures. We all know these kind of these challenges. And like Abby shared some of the, the, the experiences of people working and running these food projects, this experience of being overstretched uh, and this is unsustainable. And as a response, charities, the, the large charities are increasingly going towards corporate funding, particularly Fair Share, Trussell Trust. And I've gone to trouble. I've gone to trouble in the past for uh, having done research on uh, some of the sources of those donations and partnerships, and on why some of these charities continue to partner with organizations who profiteer from exploitation, particularly racial exploitation. And I, I can talk much more about that in the questions, but just to give you an example, as charities increasingly turn towards lived experience and how we need to learn from the lived experiences of poverty, it's, it's a particular type of lived experience which shapes decision-making. It's not the decisions um, of the delivery worker. It's not their experiences which are listened to. And as such, organisations such as the Trussell Trust continue to partner with delivery, uh, despite 
um, kind of many of the workers in delivery experiencing food insecurity and poverty. And I've met many delivery workers in our food co-op um, who know that like a fraction of the food which they receive um, comes from uh, the kind of their employer uh, because they donate money. So it, it's a really kind of vicious cycle or an exploitative cycle. And in, in my past work, I've, I've looked at poverty stigma and how food charities inadvertently reproduce this uh, through their everyday practices, particularly through voucher referral systems. And I, I could tell many, many stories. Many of them are not mine to tell. Uh, people can speak for themselves quite adequately. But when it comes to self-rationing and when you're working in these organisations and you've been told to not give food to someone who doesn't have a voucher, or when you're serving someone who's told you, I have eaten a tin a day uh, for the last two weeks and I've eaten everything now, can I get another voucher? Kind of that's the reality which I've seen on the ground. And I've got hundreds of stories of this. This sort of poverty stigma is baked in to these everyday uh, interactions. And many people on this call will have experienced that institutional stigma, you know, that feeling of being talked down to, the kind of the rehearsal, that public confession of failure, the presumption of guilt, the standing in line, the jumping through hoops, repeated, repeated filling out of forms. The intrusion, the lack of apology. Kind of, it, this is very much a dehumanizing system. And this is where I think cash first needs to go. Uh, and this is another reason why I think the surplus food model is deeply flawed. And um, we, we can talk much more about that in the questions. Uh, but I want to go on to some more hopeful um, kind of ideas. So when we're talking about public interventions, I think the debate in the UK has has been it's been exciting to see kind of different uh, proposals from cash first, right to food, kind of a legal minimum, um, such as the essentials guarantee, universal basic income, and, and more kind of technical changes of reversing some of the punitive policies uh, introduced by. Uh, the Conservative government over the last kind of 14 years. But I think as academics, as policymakers, as activists, these policies do not simply require political will. They require substantial financial resources, which have been cumulative, uh, cumulatively depleted. And I think my, my vision of where I find my hope is when I had ch have chats with people in the food co-op is joining forces with local authorities who are facing section 114s of bankruptcy, joining forces between food banks, local authorities, people with lived experience and marching on London, demanding a more radical redistributive tax policy. Because if we do not do that in five years time, we'll only be scrambling around for the scraps that fall from the table. And many of these policy ideas will not be possible unless there's a radical shift in how much money is available to spend. And you may remember kind of the Theresa May's, there's no uh, magical money tree, but there there is money here. There's plenty of money. And one of the things which Gordon Brown highlighted in that piece a couple of weeks ago, he, he drew upon the new Economics Foundation's um, kind of idea of a proposed bank levy, kind of stop paying interest payments to commercial banks in the Bank of England. So as you may know, uh, the Bank of England, funded by the Treasury, kind of pays interest payments on the commercial, um, the co commercial banks reserves, which they have to hold in the Bank of England. And between now and 2028, every year, £34 billion will be paid to an already deeply subsidised banking sector. And it's just interest rate payments. It's 2.8% of total government spending in the UK. And what the what um, the NEF are proposing is to follow the examples of Europe, 
or Switzerland or other countries and reduce the amount of interest being paid to these banks um, if interest is paid at all. That will raise a substantial amount of money which could be then funded um, into you know, household support funds or cash first approaches. And many people think, oh, that's really unpopular. Like who would support that? But despite appearances, you know, uh, YouGov poll after YouGov poll kind of points to the pop popular support of progressive taxation, particularly on the super rich. And I really, really wish that the food bank movement and local authorities would join forces to demand a wealth tax, especially on those with assets over 5 million, 10 million. This would raise billions. And it's very popular amongst conservative as well as Labour voters. And this is uh, a slide taken from Tax Justice UK, as well as the Wealth Tax Commission. There, there's an abundance of progressive policies which would resource the progressive policies needed to tackle UK poverty. And there are lots of technical fixes, which could be easy wins, but without tax justice, without kind of addressing poverty as a fiscal problem, uh, we will always, always be limited. So I, I think going back one slide, the reason why some of these policies haven't been taken up is because as a food bank movement, they have to manage their donors and it's much easier for someone like me, uh, like a lecturer, to donate a few tins than to pay a higher tax. It's much easier for someone who has a second home uh, or owns property to donate a few tins than pay higher tax. And I, I think if people with lived experiences of poverty and the food bank movement join forces to demand their share to kind of actually force a progressive capital gains tax, uh, I think there will be money in the system. So in the meantime, what do we do? And just to cap off, uh, this is one of the food co-ops uh, which we set up. It's we, we tried to set something up which was slightly different to a food bank. Um, it's a kind of a classic membership model where people pay three pound a week uh, for like 20, 25 pounds worth of food. Um, we have many migrant families, refugees, homeless people, people in uh, low paid insecure work, delivery riders, and it's free for people uh, without recourse to public funds as a part of this kind of solidarity and pushback against the hostile environment. And what's distinctive about it is there's no time limits, there's no vouchers, there's no referral procedures, you can use it week in, week out. It is a mixture of surplus food. We get our food from fair share, mixed from wholesale. Um, we're trying to build more links with the fruit market and wholesalers to reduce our dependence on, on fair share. But for me, this is a politics of the meantime, like unless or until there's ideological change to address the injustices in the system, we need to find ways of survival and resistance. And food provisioning can be part of that way of self-organizing to support each other and it's a way of kind of sharing resources which bypass this kind of rationed compassion of food charity and this is not the end product like we're trying to transition uh, beyond this cooperative model which is reliant on fair share and build longer term relationships with farmers and wholesale so wholesalers to bypass kind of the the industrial food system uh, entirely. So I'll stop there and uh, looking forward to questions. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you for your thoughts on the feedbacks movement and the importance of activism. Really interesting thoughts. So we interested to pick that up in the Q and A. So our last speaker then is Karen Williams. Um, he's the Food Banks Plus team lead at uh, Shrewsbury Food Bank. So if you'd like to go ahead, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Karen Williams and I'm the project lead of Food Bank Plus in Shrewsbury. So we are an independent food bank, and but we're not just a food bank. We actually run a whole range of unique initiatives. Um, but I think we were the third food bank to be set up in the country in 1997. 
Um, so we've been going a really long time. A lot has changed since then. And I think the majority of change has happened in the last six years. Um, I've got no PowerPoints because I assumed that people would be PowerPointed out by the time they got to me. Um, so I'm just going to tell you some stories. Um, we are on the coalface. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we've heard today that I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, but what I want to do is just give you an overview of how we work, um, picking up on some of the things that have been brought up, particularly by Andrew and Abby. Um, but also I want to talk to you about some of the stories of the people who are living experience, those people who are part of my team. I've got a team. I'm the only full-time paid member of staff. I have three part-time members and of paid staff, and I have 125 volunteer colleagues. Those volunteer, We don't call people volunteers. We call them volunteer colleagues um, because that adds dignity. Everything we do is about adding dignity and giving the people who use our service, whether we are whatever stakeholder, um, dignity. So whether that's you're a client, a colleague or a donor. Um, it's about bringing us together as community, um, but also in everything that we do, it's about putting our client first. So every decision that we make as a team um, is, does this put our client first? If it does not, then why are we doing it? Um, and we would question that. And you know, within that, we're then really professional. Um, it was interesting, something that Andrew brought up about um, donations, something that we do, you know, our sort of third stakeholder is um, a is our donors, we couldn't do without our donors, but actually we don't take grants. Um, it, or if we do, they are very, very small, very, and when I mean small, I mean like a thousand pound um, for very, very specific items. All the, all the rest of our um, donations that come in are actually from individuals, um, people in the community who want to support a community venture, providing a service for their, for their, for their community. The, um, my team is representative of the community and quite a lot of my team have lived experience. And so because we are all decision makers within that, um, actually we can use the lived experience of our, the team. Um, I was very close to using a food bank at one stage uh, before I joined. I was bereaved very suddenly. And um, as we know, when you're bereaved, actually everything falls apart psychologically. Every, I had three young children and... I, I wasn't earning at the time, uh, but my my late husband was. I was liable for a, a mortgage on the day he died. Um, and as we know, and as we've heard, things don't kick into place quickly enough to pick people up. Um, you know, it takes five weeks to be put onto universal credit. Um, what do you do in that five weeks? You are liable for a mortgage immediately on the day somebody dies where do you get that money from if you're not earning money? You know, some people don't have life insurance, some people do, but everything takes time. And I think that's where if you don't have any financial resilience or people supporting you that are unable to, you know, contribute to your life at that moment of crisis, that's where, um, you know, places like food banks uh, step in and can be really helpful. But I recognize that they're not long term. Um, they are, you know, they can't pick up the pieces of general society. Uh, you know, we are all responsible for our community and that can't just be done through food banks. Um, so the way we work is we've got Shrewsbury Food Bank. Uh, that's one of 11 initiatives that we run. We've then got our debt advice, uh, which is part of community money advice. Uh, we also then have 360. So 360 is totally unique to us as Food Bank Plus. Um, and that is where we develop life skills with people in the long term through building relationships to help them uh, be more resilient to, for example, downstairs at the moment, there's digital inclusion classes going on as part of our 360 drop in. I know somebody else is helping somebody fill in a pit form. Um, so it's those types of supportive measures that we can put in place um, with our clients um, so that actually they don't need to use the food bank. Actually, if they could get their PIP in place, there was a guy recently that we've worked with, let's call him David. Um, he is an ex-soldier. He came to us through a partner organization, uh, a local charity, uh, because he was living on the streets in his car, eventually had to sell his car because he needed some money. So he had nowhere to live. So currently, uh, they were able to put him in local temporary accommodation, and that's a real issue here in rural Shropshire, um, in a glamping pod at, a, at the showground. So he lives there. The problem is with that, that floods regularly, so he has to get out of that regularly as well. Um, so it's not just issues of food that he is facing. 
actually he's facing issues of temporary accommodation. He's also facing issues of that temporary accommodation, although it's, you know, he quite likes it, it floods. So it's, you know, that knock on effect, that psychological effect of, you know, that we've talked about the emotional effect of that. That's what, that's the real impact of uh, the, this particular client. So he was he came in to use food bank. We do have a referral system, but we have tried, we don't use paper vouchers. We're a digital organization um, because we try and be really innovative as well um, to, so that it's easier for our clients. But actually we want that triangle of, uh, you know, that golden triangle of client, us and referrer working all together for the benefits of the client. And we will hold our referrers to account. If we don't think that somebody is working with that client because we can't do everything um, effectively, we will pick them up on that. Or if we think they're making referrals that are not really, you know, just passing the buck, we will actually contact referrers to discuss that type of thing with them. But also, we also partner with housing associations who come on site. We partner with Samaritans who are on site. We will partner with Women's Aid who are on site to enable, you know, to give that holistic um, support to our clients. So let's go back to the client we were talking about in temporary accommodation. One of the things we did with him uh, before he was able to get his PIP payment, because again, that takes ages, the process, um, we were actually able to, with him, because he didn't have access to the internet, purchase a, um, a travel card, a, a, a rail card. That gives him huge discounts to, to enable him to go down to the hills 15 miles away on the train to walk. For him, that is hugely beneficial in terms of his mental health. We are not feeding him at that point, but what he is having is something beyond food bank. And I think that's an important thing that as food banks, we engage with people when they are in crisis at their most vulnerable. You know, they don't, most people don't choose to come here. They have no choice when they hit us. Um, but actually if we can then provide other services uh, beyond food, actually their lives look a lot better outside. Now I know this particular chap, he's now had his PIP payments in place. He's still in temporary accommodation, but he's now able to look for permanent accommodation because he's got finance to do that. And he's even bought himself a car so he can travel around. That's amazing. He looks different. Um, and in fact, he wrote a poem the other day that said about being within Food Bank Plus, he was in, a, in our Create group, 360 Create, about it being a safe space. And I think that's what's really important as well. Because we're non-statutory, often people feel we're safe. Um, another particular client that we worked with, again, talking about temporary accommodation, which is increasingly a, a, an issue that people are facing. Um, this lady, she came out of a, an abusive relationship. We helped her prepare for that. Um, so she was using food bank and we, we enabled her to use food. She used food at bank to enable her to save money for a running away fund um you know because actually that was vital for her so up to that you know that was the reason for using food bank so she could be empowered to do something else with her finances and that's sometimes what we have to do as well is look beyond the there's an empty cupboard actually if somebody is going into a new house because uh and they can't afford the stuff to like new duvets towels, stuff like that. Maybe what we can do, because we do offer home starter packs, but actually there's more dignity in saying to somebody, let's provide your food for the week. You go and buy what you need for your new home. So we, it's about helping them shift their finances around when they're really, really limited. Um, so this particular lady, she um, came out of that relationship um, and she was told by um, our local housing team that actually with two young children under the age of three, she the temporary accommodation was traveling to Birmingham, but she would still have to. So that is 50 miles from here. She would have to still uh, bring her child back to school because obviously it was a temporary situation on a daily basis. So she actually chose to turn that down. The problem is by turning that down, she ended up going down the housing ladder, you know, it, and all these decisions. And she thought she was doing the best for her children. All these decisions have a knock on effect on a much broader thing than just food. It's not, it's never just about the food. And I think that's important if, when policymakers are making decisions. First of all, I would invite them to come into food banks and spend some time working with teams and actually meeting clients and observing what happens and the reality of the tears, the reality of the stories, um, because that, 
you know, you feel at that point. But also think about the much, much broader picture. It is so much bigger than just a parcel of food. Um, well, anyway, let's go back to this lady. Let's call her Ellie. She um, ended up going back to her parents' house, uh, which is more local. But that was the, really, really squashed to the point she couldn't actually close the bedroom door. So she had no dignity getting changed. She had to go into the bathroom to get changed to make sure her dad, you know, so she said, said it was like being a student again, despite the fact she had children and things. Eventually, she got a, uh, she got a local housing authority, you know, authority home. She sent me a photograph of Christmas time with her, with her children, with, um, you know, a beautiful tree. And it was beautiful because actually she'd she'd come out of that situation herself. Um, but it had taken a lot of time. And it, as I say, it wasn't just about the food. It was about housing. It was about her mental health. It was about coming out of an abusive relationship. It was about, you know, ma maintaining her children's education at nursery and things like that. We've never, we haven't seen her again. She doesn't need food bank anymore, um, which is fantastic. It was a, it was a real temporary thing uh, for her. Um, the, one of the things we do is we fundraise for people through an, a website called Acts 435. So sometimes people need a fridge. Sometimes people need a washing machine. We've had somebody ask for a washing machine recently because they're totally incontinent as an adult. First of all, they don't want to be incontinent. That's not a choice that they make. Um, but actually the, the, the need for a washing machine is huge for them because actually that's about the dignity. They don't necessarily need food, but they do need a washing machine with a tumble dryer so they can churn out the, you know, the washing and they can go to bed in a clean bed. And that's where um, organisations like ours, beyond just the food bank, um, can support people in fundraising. Um, we work with the local authority, particularly the families team, uh, where somebody needs, you know, somebody's at risk of going on a register of some sort and, um so social services will ring and say, can you get a skip for somebody? They need a skip. They need to clear out their house. Now, some fundraising takes a long time. We've got a crisis fund that we can actually get with a local skip company. We can get a skip in place really quickly within a week so that person can clear their house out and then work with social services or the, you know, the family's team um, in a much more effective way. We have nothing to do with that apart from buying a skip for them. And that's it. And I think it's about trying to be creative and work with the clients with the needs that they have um, through creative ways of, of funding and things like that. We've talked about food. Our food parcels, uh, they last for seven days. They are nutritionally balanced. We provide fresh fruit and veg. Now, I know some food banks refuse to provide fresh fruit and veg, um, you know, because they feel that it should be emergencies only. Um, actually, for us, it's about providing that balanced diet. We also link him with a local farmer um, and he provides us with organic frozen beef, um, a whole cow at least once a year. So that's amazing. But I'm going to draw it to a close there because I think we're going to have some questions and answers. But thank you for your time. Great, Karen. Thank you so much for your for your um, thoughts and sharing. Uh, there is a question for you in the chat now. So if there are any, if anybody else has any other questions, you can drop it in the chat or you can um, just give us a shout. So um, John has asked, you mentioned the 360 initiative is unique to Foodbank Plus. It's great to hear about it and such positive stories. Are there any plans in place to help roll this out to other food banks, food charities, or do you have any advice for other services to help them get started with offering these wider services um, within their staff and voluntary colleagues who are already overstretched so um currently there are no plans to develop that anywhere else but certainly just because um you know we we thought about it when we first set it up the way i've designed it is that it's a bolt-on that you can actually attach different things depending on what your social your local setting is um but certainly if people are interested in coming to have a look you'd be really really welcome and we can start that discussion just on Karen's point about that importance of the triangle of um, refers the client and support services, um, I wonder, could the other panelists highlight, is this an issue within um, the organisations that they're working with or the people that they're working with? And are there particular partners they feel they should be working with in the future or they would they would like to engage with? That's just open to any of the panelists. <laughs> I suppose, KK, if I can um, come back just from uh, the Consumer Council perspective, we have a consumer support team that help with individual complaints. And it's really just to echo what Karen is saying, that 
people will not present with one problem. They're not just mm -hmm. coming to us because they have a problem with their energy bill. Um, yeah. So a big part of our team's job is to try and get beneath the immediate issue and see what else is going on. Um, and people can be quite reticent. There is stigma attached yeah. to admitting just how hard things have got. So um, so certainly that that chimed with with what we're seeing so thank you Karen and John has the question um where do we go from here so many issues and, and so much need realistically what is achievable now I think um you know I, I always talk to particularly our donors because they've obviously got an interest immediately and they have a stake immediately that actually they can campaign their local MP um and I'll whatever party our local MP comes from they have to be representative of what's in the local community um, and that's a really, really important local starting point um, and quite easy because often they've got surgeries and things like that, that people can actually go and talk to them personally. Um, and I think also it's about our local organisations building relationships so that we can get in the room of those decision makers, um, but also highlight and invite people in, whether we agree with them or not, if they're local decision makers, bring them into the space so they can actually see what's going on. There's another question from Sophie. Um, question about how the panelists see the balance between being ambitious with policy asks, but also operating with the level of what might be pragmatic or winnable in the current political climate, I'm assuming. I'm just reflecting on the last 10 years of policy asks by food charities, and it has been mostly on tinkering. Um, I'm I'm not belittling the efforts. Like a huge amount of energy and coordination has been put into uh, the five week wait and kind of campaigns over universal credit, uh, the essentials guarantee. I think we need to keep those keep those up. But I think without like power will not concede anything without a demand. And I think we need to be a lot more ambitious because if we're not ambitious about readdressing the kind of the, the structural violence of how much money has been lost over the last 14 years you know that public table which we're asking for scraps from has been depleted so much that we, we need to start widening it uh, and for me a wealth tax given its popularity with the electorate um and the fact that it only will affect 20,000 people in the UK, uh, I, I think that's something which we could feasibly ask for. Dominic, we have our blog author um, in the audience here. Dominic, are you there? I know there's not a lot of time, so I don't, I don't really know how much to share. I would just say that um, I truly appreciate like the passion and the kind of well-meaning work that's being demonstrated by all the speakers and also the kind of acknowledgement of people who actually have experiences of poverty and food insecurity. But I would kind of politely also suggest that it would be encouraging if we got to speak for ourselves, as this is like a painful like daily realities that we're going through. So, um, it, you know, in a kind of knowledge exchange way where, you know, the poor can learn from your expertise and you can learn from, from poor people's expertise as well, which I think has been demonstrated, but I think it needs to be highlighted that we need to be involved in, in policies that affect our, the development of policies or discussions or forums around them that affect our every day i don't know if yeah i should probably just quickly introduce myself so i'm a single dad my universal credit is currently being suspended so literally got nothing i live in the most deprived blocks of my council estate uh with my amazing daughter which my estate the shop on the estate it only sells the lowest quality of food so it's actually a food desert ironically in the garden of england and I'll just I'll just give you guys this reflection of when I was working, uh, volunteering at the local social supermarket. I think that's how they phrase it. There was it was it was kind of 
shared to me about this group of of four people i won't describe them but there was a group in of four or five people that were there and i don't know if yeah hopefully people can reflect on this but they they were there and i'll just say on like a wednesday and a thursday every morning waiting for them to open because they knew that um that was the days that they got the the delivery from fair share now the the people that were accessing this this the use of the social supermarket would be leaving in one in a convertible Saab and the other one in a convertible BMW. This was last summer. So it was very obvious that their cars were convertible and they'd put the shop in that they got from there in the back and drive off. This is to just say, and I can't give out too much detail of what was shared with me about these individuals, but this just I think it I think it demonstrates that there is there is an element within our society that doesn't actively kind of doesn't see that the poor are deserving and that these services should be given or used by or accessible by people who are perhaps not as, yeah, well, just poor as other people. And I think that it kind of speaks to a level of snobbery that I've experienced both in professional spaces, both in um like academic spaces but also in terms of access to services now my blocks as i've said are the most deprived i'm going to be really quick but a lot of my neighbors and maybe some of the older ones it could be a generational thing but i'm just going to share it anyway i'm on the board of my local food bank so sometimes i'll be like i can tell one a gentleman is hard up or whatever i'll be like oh you should access the food bank i can give you their number and they'll be like, no, that's for poor people. So, and these these aren't people just living in a council estate. These are my neighbours living in the most deprived blocks of the council estate. That, but they they kind of don't see themselves, at, so they wouldn't allow themselves to access it. So I guess it's that kind of. I, I guess I'm just quickly trying to demonstrate that there is there is an approach to the well-meaning work that is being done that maybe isn't fully inclusive of poor people for whatever maybe social constructs that it is, while also some people see poor people as undeserving and so they should have access to. I'll, I'll leave it there because I, I could talk um, uh, quite passionately for longer, so I'll stop there. I hope that's helpful on some level. Thank you, Dominic. Yeah, we do have one more question um there's a question from emmanuel with the proposed cash payments option do we have any estimations of how much this may cost annually um and the source of such funds maybe is that a question for you abby yes yeah, so there is a lot of research into the costing of emergency cash payments but um what kind of some research from and furniture poverty who we work with really closely has come out around the local welfare assistance schemes that were being run uh, with the household support for money and what they're calling for uh, based on their own research is for the household support fund the, the permanency of the household support fund to uh, be in the region of at least a billion so uh that's a estimate based on sort of research that's in its infancy at the minute but this uh there are schemes that are that are being costed and it's also possible as well with uh the scottish welfare fund the discretionary payments both in northern ireland and wales england is the only i i know this isn't a sort of a england based uh webinar but the idea of having emergency cash payments is something that is not new and is here. So it is possible. It just needs the, like um, Andrew said in his presentation, it needs the money to be released and it needs the political will to make it happen as well. I think I will bring the event to the close now. Thank you so much for all of our speakers for their contributions. Um, I think there are go there's going to be a lot of conversations happening uh, after the event. Um, okay, so we, this will be, um, so this is recorded and, and will be on our YouTube channel. Um, we will also do a summary blog on uh, all of the contributions today with um, the slides attached. Um, so thank you very much for attending.